We all know about Stonehenge, one of the ancient world's great mysteries. But one discovery right here in North America has raised a provocative theory that something similar might exist at the bottom of Lake Michigan. 2007, near Traverse Bay, Michigan. Underwater archaeologist Dr. Mark Holley and his team of divers are scouring the lake bottom. We were out looking for a specific shipwreck. It's just flat sand for as far as you can go. And it's just very eerie. Instead of a wreck, they stumble across something much older. At first glance, it's just a line of stones. But Holly says there's more to it. I knew that we'd found something that shouldn't be there, but we had no idea what it was. One set of stones forms a circle. And strangest of all, look at this. One of the stones appears to have a detailed carving of a mastodon here outlined with red chalk. Holly estimates the site was constructed around 10,000 years ago, before the glaciers melted to create the lake. Of course, Holly's video goes viral. Almost immediately, people described it as a fake. Nothing like this had ever been found in the Great Lakes before. Real or not, the discovery becomes known as the Lake Michigan Stonehenge and raises the question, was it made by the same people who built England's famed structure? Professor of anthropology Michael Masters raises a controversial theory that ancient Europeans migrated to the Americas long before Columbus. This tool technology associated with groups largely in France indicates that they came across between 20,000 and 15,000 years ago. Paleolithic Europeans in America? While some scholars are open to the idea, others point out that ancient Native Americans created their own astounding sites, like those of the mound builders in the Mississippi Valley. So who made it, and how, and what does it mean? One more thing to ponder. There's a region known for strange disappearances and anomalous sightings called the Lake Michigan Triangle. Early reports put the find there. But Holly now says it's north in Grand Traverse Bay, so what do our experts have to say about this fascinating find? First, we ask archaeologist Peter Campbell if this could all be a hoax. He points to the moss and algae on the stones. If they had been placed recently, then there would be no marine growth on them whatsoever. The formation as well appears to be a genuine archaeological site. Campbell thinks the find is ancient and man-made. And if the mastodon carving is real, it might provide a window into a long-lost culture. It's possible that this really had some sort of religious connotation and perhaps a religious offering or ritual related to the hunt. But still, how did they carve that image into granite rock? Anthropologist Kathy Strain says it would have been difficult, but very doable. So in order to make a petroglyph, it's a very simple process. It is taking a rock and pecking at the patina that's on the outside of the target rocks. Granite is a hard substance, but no special tools would have been needed. Um, rock art appears around the world using a similar method, and none of those people had anything other than a rock. As far as comparisons to the English Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a group of rocks put into a circle for a religious purpose. And we're very heavy to move, and we are still not entirely certain how they accomplished it. The rocks at the bottom of Lake Michigan are more in a line. Take another look at the arrangement of the Lake Michigan stones. Strain says it's very revealing. This is likely what we call a drive line, and you use it to herd animals into either over a cliff or into some kind of fenced area. So it's a very efficient way of hunting. It would be the oldest drive or hunting line ever found. When the glaciers melted more than 10,000 years ago, they submerged the site at the bottom of Lake Michigan, preserving it to this day. And Campbell thinks it could be groundbreaking in other ways. If this is, in fact, a mastodon drawn on this rock, then it is a monumental discovery, because this would be the earliest Paleo-Indian art that's been discovered so far. Our verdict? Well, Mark Holly definitely discovered something man-made. We think by early Native American tribes, not early European immigrants. 
But whether it was built for hunting or some other purpose, we can't know until it's studied further. Prehistoric cave paintings often depict common animals encountered by early man, like bison and mammoths. But some newly discovered images are so unusual, many are wondering if they are evidence some early tribe was visited by something otherworldly. It's July 2014 in the Indian state of Chattisgarh, where there are a number of caves and paintings made by hunter-gatherer populations going back as far as 10,000 years. Archaeologist J.R. Bagad claims he recently made a unique discovery here. While giving a tour to reporters, Bagad shows a rock face on which there are half a dozen dark red and yellow painted beings standing together in a group. In this particular painting, which looks quite strange, we have some individuals with larger heads, different colored arms and, and hands, and, and they don't look like the other people depicted on these cave walls. So uh, we have a lot of people believing that the ancient humans who painted these drawings were actually painting images of aliens from another world. The theory that these are depictions of extraterrestrials is bolstered by another painting of what appears to be a mechanical looking disc painted on the cave ceiling. It resembles a saucer shaped object which became kind of the pop cultural representation of UFOs in the 1950s and 60s. These aren't the only ancient representations of allegedly extraterrestrial beings. We also have a number of other ancient civilizations who have created similar things. For instance, we have the Wajina figures in a rock shelter in Australia. We also have petroglyphs in Capitol Reef State Park here in the United States. Let's take another look at this disc-shaped object from India. These three lines, right here, again right here, and right here, have alternately been described as beams or legs of a tripod, and these apparent portholes right here and right here match with contemporary representations of alien spacecraft. So what can our experts unearth about this peculiar cave art? First, anthropologist Kathy Strange says these ancient drawings must have marked a significant event or encounter. They're not just doodles. Cave walls are very valuable. So for them to paint this, it must have been something important to them as a people. They're trying to represent something that they want to pass on to the next generation. These bulbous-headed figures do indeed resemble the humanoid depictions of aliens that eventually dominated in the 20th century. So a connection seems possible. However, archaeologist Ed Barnhart believes they are documentation of a different kind of cosmic trip. These ancient cultures relied upon people called shamans who would typically go into altered states of consciousness to receive information, and those were induced by hallucinogenic drugs or starvation or sleep deprivation. What they painted on the walls were their experiences they were having during their hallucinogenic trances. In those caves, they would feel like they're floating outside of their body and they would show themselves elongated and the floor falling out below them. It's not that the figures' heads were extra large, but that the bodies were stretched as they felt they were floating up. And as for the UFO-like object, that's also more likely something else from the heavens. Instead of it being a beam from an alien ship, it actually is just sun rays. And they're projecting that the sun is at its full potential, probably noon right above your head. There's other examples in the general area in India and other places in the world that show a very similar object. Our verdict? These well-preserved Indian rock paintings are most likely the work of shamans from prehistoric hunter-gatherer societies who made them while in an altered state of consciousness. Even if these ancient artists weren't seeing aliens, they were definitely experiencing something truly out of this world. Medieval legend tells us that King Arthur received the sword Excalibur from a magical lady of the lake. In other versions, he pulls the sword from a stone. Well, what if this legend is based on facts? A recent discovery might make you believe. October 2019, near the Verbas River in Bosnia, archaeology professor Ivana Panzik is studying the ruins of a medieval fortress. 
But the discovery of a relic under the choppy rapids shocks Ponzik and her team. It's a sword lodged straight into a stone in the riverbed about 36 feet below the surface. Despite being down there for probably hundreds of years, the sword is remarkably well preserved. We did several dives to decide what we're gonna use during the excavation. The whole process of excavating the sword took us two days. The team manages to free the blade, but how this sword got in this stone in the first place is a mystery. Could it be the very Excalibur from the King Arthur legend? No concrete evidence exists that a real King Arthur actually ruled parts of England, beyond what was written about him centuries later. Some historians think he could be based on a real 5th century Romano-British leader named Romatheus, who fought invading Goths. Details are scarce, but even if Arthur is entirely fictional, could the story of Excalibur have inspired medieval copycats? It's possible that if this legend of King Arthur did make its way into Bosnia-Herzegovina, that individuals were attempting to recreate this story, to encase a sword in stone so that the rightful heir of this kingdom could pull the sword out in the same way that King Arthur did. Or maybe it's the other way around. Could this real sword in the stone be the inspiration for the King Arthur legend? So the big question is, could a sword really penetrate a rock? Look, that's a tough one. Most rocks are much harder than any pointed steel blade. So how can we explain this strange find? It's time to convene our own Knights of the Round Table. Maritime archeologist Peter Campbell says, based on the testing done by the museum in Bosnia, the dates don't line up for it to have belonged to King Arthur or to have inspired his legend. This sword dates to the 13th to 15th century AD. The legendary King Arthur predates this sword by nearly a thousand years. So we can definitely discard the notion that this sword is in any way Excalibur. And what about the notion that the noblemen of the nearby fortress could have an Arthur copycat? Yes, it would be strange to do such a thing in a river, and Campbell agrees. One hypothesis that's been raised is the sword was put in the stone deliberately as part of some sort of king-making ceremony. We can effectively discard this notion because the sword was found at 36 feet, which is far deeper than they would have been able to dive in the 13th to 15th century AD. Still, he believes, based on what he sees, the sword belonged to someone important. We can see that it is finely crafted. It was very expensive metal used in its manufacture. And all of that indicates that this was probably the sword of a noble person. And that leads him to think there is some ritualistic reason it's in the water. There's actually a very well-developed tradition, especially in Europe, of discarding of swords and armor in rivers, lakes, and bogs. And this dates from the Bronze Age all the way up through the medieval period. If somebody wins a major battle, they can discard the sword into the river as some sort of ritual offering. And as to how it ended up lodged in the stone. Frequently, we see heavy objects deposited in rivers that work their way down with the current into sediment or into rocks. And then it has many centuries of wiggling and burrowing down into the cracks. The metal is also corroding, attaching it to the rocks, and sediment is filling in, and it's becoming rock itself. This explains why the sword appeared to be stuck in the rock. In fact, these are normal site formation processes, as we call them, for river environments. So, our verdict? This is a geological phenomenon. The sword didn't penetrate the stone. The stone built up around the sword. However, the sword's true origin and owner still remain a mystery. Perhaps it was wielded by another legendary king. We've all heard of the lost city of Atlantis, which, according to tradition, lies somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle. But you probably didn't know that Japan has its own legendary lost kingdom called Yamatai, or that some believe it's been found. Japan's Ryukyu Islands extend almost to Taiwan, and they've long been an attraction to divers. Most come to see hammerhead sharks, but in 1986, Deborah Dixon Smith came for another reason. She was there to get a special tour of the official site known as Yonaguni. 
you go in this dramatic entrance, it was like stepping back in time. Once out through the other side, a whole city seems to appear. It really just was one of those wow moments. And when you look over the edge, you can see down into this very, very deep gully. It was very dramatic. Let's take another look at the details here. There are straight lines, steps, and sharp angles. It seems to be that whatever this structure is, somebody built it there, and sea levels rose enough that it got submerged. In this artist's rendering, it looks like a small city or a compound with a pyramid. And as Deborah learned, the site may be connected to an ancient legend. There's a theory that the video is evidence of an ancient Japanese civilization known as Yamatai. It's said to have been a large, powerful nation that was wiped off the face of the world when uh, sea waters rose and their cities were buried under ocean water. Yamatai is said to have been ruled by a secretive sorceress named Himiko. Its location has never been determined, much less the reasons for its disappearance. Here's the thing. Unlike Atlantis, the existence of Yamatai shows up in historic documents from around 300 AD. There's even a record of their queen, Himiko, sending an envoy to the Chinese emperor. The theory is that Yamatai sank due to the shifting tectonic plates in the region. But what's the real story? Let's see how our experts tell it. Geologist Bob Anderson says it's not unreasonable to think this site was once on dry land. And if you go back 20,000 years ago, the shorelines moved around to different places, so you can't rule out that that was above water. But did humans build it? The strongest evidence are those angles and steps. They seem too perfect to be formed by nature, at least to our eye. But it turns out that can happen naturally. These are the sorts of things that geologic formations can break into because of earthquakes or tsunamis as they move. Those plates break in very, very geometric forms. There's no reason to believe that they had to be cut by man. But if this is all natural, wouldn't we expect to see similar structures all over the planet? This site is a geological phenomena. I don't know of another area where that large of stones have been moved in that kind of formation. But that does not make it a structure. One big issue. Barnhart says these massive steps are actually larger than anything ever sculpted, carved, or constructed in the ancient world. And even though this is the most seismically active area of the entire planet, you'd still expect to find more evidence of a prior civilization if one had been here. These large slabs, you'd expect at least in the cracks to find some sort of evidence of human occupation if it in indeed was some sort of sunken place. There's nothing like that whatsoever. Archaeology calls those things geofacts. They look like artifacts, but in fact, they're naturally formed. Based on Barnhart and Anderson's expertise, we're going to conclude that this site is a natural phenomenon. That means it's not the lost kingdom of Yamatai. Its location is still a mystery. So if you're diving off the coast of Japan, keep your eyes open. Remember that giant rolling boulder from Raiders of the Lost Ark? The scene was inspired by a very real archaeological mystery, the likes of which even Indiana Jones might find unsolvable. Take a look. 1939, Diki Delta, Costa Rica. The United Fruit Company was clearing an area of the Costa Rican jungle to start a banana plantation. And suddenly they discovered something truly mysterious. At sites all across the area, workers uncover these. Stones that have been carved into near-perfect spheres of all sizes. The largest one was nine feet in diameter and 16 tons. It would take an incredible amount of craftsmanship and masterful engineering to create, especially the large spheres. Many of the stones are within 5% of being perfect spheres, a difficult task to execute precisely even when using calibrated machinery. This is a remarkable feat if carved from a larger rock by hand. When the first Western people 
came to Costa Rica and saw these spheres, they had never seen anything like it. Archaeologists believe they were carved by a tribe known as the Diquis, which flourished from AD 700 to 1500. They produced at least 300 of these stones. But the Diquis faded away hundreds of years ago, and how they made the stones disappeared with them. By the 1940s, local indigenous tribes believed the stones were of divine origin. The native Costa Rican people believed that these spheres are actually from their god. Terra, who was the thunder god, used them with a blowpipe in defense of the native Costa Ricans. They believed Terra shot the stones at the gods of wind and hurricanes to keep them at bay. Some have speculated that these battles between Terra and the other gods were actually a titanic shooting match between UFOs, with the stones some sort of spent weapon. They point to the spheres near perfect roundness as proof of alien creation. But if we assume humans made them, not gods, the question is why? In the 1930s and 40s, rumors spread they'd been made to store gold in the spheres' cores, so workers blew up several and found nothing. Another possibility is that the spheres serve a scientific purpose. One theory that has been posited is that they are somehow a representation of our solar system, that they represent celestial bodies somehow. They might have been placed to track the seasons or rolled around to reflect the shifting night sky. There's also a theory that an advanced civilization, even older than the Dikis, built an entire complex of cities here. It wouldn't be a surprise if we uncover other temples or other places out there that we just haven't found yet that may represent an older civilization that was there. Here's a twist. The Costa Rican stone spheres aren't alone. In 2016, an archaeologist uncovered this massive sphere in Bosnia. Then also, there are these in New Zealand. Let's see if our experts can solve this mystery without blowing anything up. We turn to archaeologist Ed Barnhart, who has seen the spheres himself. Most of them in Costa Rica now have been rolled into parks or they're in front of government buildings. It's part of the difficulty interpreting of what they are is the fact that they've all been rolled out of context. So if they once lined up with the stars, sun, and moon, we will never know. Why people made them may remain a mystery, but Barnhart thinks he knows how they were made. When I visited this location, I stopped on the bridge and looked down on the river, and I could see circular stones just like this. They're called concretions. A concretion is when minerals build up around a core like a pebble and then over years layer on concentrically, creating a round hard rock. Geologists think this is exactly how the spheres in Bosnia and others around the world likely formed. But Barnhart sees the hand of man and just how smooth and round the Costa Rican stones are. They weren't always perfectly circular, so they chipped it here, they chipped it there, and made it more circular. It took hundreds, even thousands of hours of scraping and polishing. Then they had to roll these rocks, some weighing 15 tons to their sites. Barnhart takes this as a sign of a dynamic, thriving culture. But what happened to this culture remains a mystery. Those archaeological sites were once living cities. They were abandoned. Hundreds of years of forest came up, grew all around them. So for the stone spheres, we're crediting natural forces and human industry, most likely by members of the Dikis culture. But why people carved and placed the stones is still unsolved. 